Do you have a journal of some sort? Maybe it's a prayer journal. Maybe it's a scripture journal. But a place where you just jot down things that you're praying for. Maybe verses that you're particularly uh, impressed on your heart for a season of your life. Maybe it's the margin of your Bible. That seems to be my habit. I just kind of scribble all up and down. And hopefully you've taken a time to reflect and go back and just stop and see what God has done for you over the seasons of your life. And what you'll find is that as soon as you read your little note, the whole flood of emotions come back and you're almost there in that spot where you were. You go, oh, I remember that. I remember how I was feeling. I remember that thing. And you see God's hand of grace just being retraced in your life. You're seeing him working and you're seeing that in your own experience of what he's done for you. And what you're doing is, as you jot down and then look back, you're adding as information to your living testimony about what God has done, his grace, his faithfulness, maybe his patience or mercy, just as you've experienced right directly from his hand. And Psalm 116 is a song written very much like a testimony. It's as if the psalmist is opening up his prayer journal and sharing with us his emotion, what he relied on, what scripture he went to, all the things that drew him out of this period of lament that he was in. See, he's been in a very dark period, and what Psalm 116 is, is the psalmist is looking back because it's the end of lament. He's now on the other side looking back through his journal and saying, this is what God has done for me. And he's reflecting on that. And we get to walk alongside him as he opens up, in fact, his heart, his emotions, the etchings, the scribbles on his journal and saying, look what God has done. He's fantastic. Let me share that with you and show you perhaps a way that you also can scrabble out of those periods of darkness where you feel things are closing in on you. We hear his story of a great reversal of lament and back in to fullness of life that God carries out in his soul. And if you're like me, that's what I get when I hear other people's testimonies. It's a joy to hear them about when they would do baptisms and things or member interviews. We hear the traces of God's grace in their life. And what it does is it opens up my eyes to experience God through their lens in a way that I had not known previously and expands my heart to love God more, to see him for he truly is. And that's what the psalmist here does for us in Psalm 116. He shows us that God is always faithful, always present, always at work, bringing good in our lives, even if we don't recognize it at the time we're going through a rough season. And this is what is meant in Romans 8, 28, when Paul writes, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. All things, all seasons. Nothing is left out of the word all. It's everything. But yet sometimes our feelings and emotions don't recognize that at all in darkness. And this is what God promises for us too. Today, tomorrow, and every day thereafter to give your soul rest. To bring you his grace and faithfulness fully for you to experience as he opens up his hands of love and just showers it upon you. And the psalmist here wants us to join him. He's opening up his prayer journal. He's sitting beside us, and he's saying, look what God has done. That's where we're going this morning. This is good news, for at the end of lament, no matter what we are going through, we always see God's trace of grace in our lives. So let's pray, then let's open up the word and see what he has to tell us. 
Father, we thank you so much for your great word. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would now breathe out the very Spirit of God onto these words, that they are life to us. I ask that you would bless your people, Lord, especially those who are discouraged, who feel, Lord, that they still feel the weightiness of perhaps turmoil or trouble or trauma in their life. And Lord, they want to experience more of God. So Lord, I pray that you would shine the glory of God through the face of Jesus Christ, through your words directly into their hearts this morning. That we would all grow in Christ and see you for who truly are, not just who we think you are, but who you say you are. Faithful, merciful, good. Lord, open our eyes to all of your grandeur. In your good name, through Jesus Christ, amen. So open along with me to Psalm 116. Hope you have your Bible or something to track. Psalm 116. The heading says, I love the Lord. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death They encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. So return, O my rest to your, O my soul to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believe this even when I spoke. I am greatly afflicted. And I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Oh, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant, for you have loosed my bonds. So I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. This psalm is part of book five in the Psalms. If you didn't know that, every once in a while you'll see a little uh, heading there and say this section is a new book of the Psalms. This book five is from Psalm 107 to 150. And in this section of the Psalms, they're not just scattered in there haphazardly. There is a meaning, a purpose, and a focus in each book. And in this book five, the focus is on God's work to deliver and return all things as they should be. It is looking forward to his day, the day of the Lord, when he will make all things right. And these psalms do that by always looking back at God's faithfulness and then looking forward in hope to what he will do. And part of that renewal is traced here in Psalm 116, where the psalmist describes his own personal experience of deliverance. It fits into that theme. Part one, uh, Psalm 116 is also part of a special group, Psalm 113 to 118, five or six psalms, called the Egyptian Hallel, which means Passover praise. These are specific psalms that Israel would sing during the Passover. So these probably came about after their exile, coming back into Jerusalem, that inner testament. Tem- Uh, Testament period, and they would sing these songs. Most likely, these are the songs that Jesus and his disciples would sing at their meal of Passover. And it's remarkable that here as we look at this Psalm 16, which is the end of lament, that it's the very time where Jesus is about to walk down the road of his deepest and darkest lament. As he goes to the cross and swallows the wrath of God 
for us. And we don't have to taste that bitter cup. So this is a very beautiful psalm that just highlights this deliverance and expression and experience of what he's experienced as God has taken him out of lament and into life again. And he lays out for us three main sections. He's responding to lament, then he's retracing God's grace, and then he sees a new return as he comes back to the Lord. First, we see a responding to lament, and that's in this summary section of verse 1 to 3, where he shares what's been going on in a brief snapshot. So verse 1 and 2, if you want to think of this as a song, which it is, it sets the whole tone and chorus, refrain and bridge the emotion of the song. Just like when you turn on a song on the uh, radio or throw on a CD, whatever you're listening to, I guess you don't even do that anymore, right? And so everything's on uh, yeah, Spotify or uh, whatever we listen to. Um, But immediately, within just a few bars, you know where this song's going. You know if it's going to be an uplifting song or if it's one of sobering reflection on what has gone wrong. The psalmist here walks us through that. It's showing where God has taken him from lament and moving him to restoration. And it's as if, again, we're standing with him with his journal open, We're starting to sit down and talk with him as he shares about what God's doing. Suddenly he just looks up, looks you square in the eyes, and he goes, I love the Lord. And then he starts to say, why? He's looking through all of his scribbled notes, and he says, because God heard my voice, my pleas. He inclined his ear to me three times. Right here in these first couple verses, he says that. This is huge for the psalmist. Why? Because as you remember, as we've gone through these psalms of lament over the summer, specifically Psalm 13, 42, 43, and 73, all the cries there in the psalms are, How long, O Lord? Where are you, Lord? How come you don't hear me, Lord? How come you're not there? Have you forgotten me? But not here. Because the psalmist declares, God does hear. He he turned his ear towards me. He stretched himself out low and inclined his ear and listened to me. That's the picture here. I remember watching uh, old westerns when I was a kid. And you know how at the part where the, the bandits or wherever they put their ear down to the railroad tracks, listening for the train way far away? It works. I tried it. And you can hear that thing on the track way before you can see it in the distance. And the picture is exactly that of our God. Our God is laying down, stooped low, feet or ears down low to hear exactly the track in your life, what you're going through, what you're dealing with. He hears, even though sometimes it does not feel like it in our soul. So is God listening? The psalmist exclaims, never doubt it. He's always there. And he responds then in verse 2. So I will call on him as long as I live. I will call on the Lord. And this again is one of the key thoughts of the psalmist. Four times that phrase is mentioned. Either call on the Lord or call on the name of the Lord. Verse 2, 4, 13, 17. And notice the language. It's not called out. It's called on. See, when you call out, you're just looking for someone's attention, anybody's. Just, hey, I'm here. But when you call on someone, you are anticipating a response. You are anticipating help to come, to take action on your behalf. So it's crucial that we call on the right one. You've probably seen those stickers, especially if you're like in a construction area. It says on the back, call 811. Well, there's a big difference between 811 and 911. When you call 911, you're actually going to get help. When you call 811, someone's going to tell you where the gas line is in your yard. That's not helpful in a time of crisis. 
So we don't just call out. The psalmist is streamlining us in focus right to who to rely on. It is God. And he is saying, this is where I'm going to my audience of one. I love the Lord. He has heard. He inclined his ear. I will call on him. And then he shares why he's calling out on God. Because his trauma is real. This is not just some emotional blip in the psalmist's life. He has been to hell and back. At least that's how it feels to him. Read in verse 3 with me. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol, that's the grave, laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Our English loses the poetry, rhythm, and cadence of the Hebrew. So maybe the closest we could say is the noose of the dead encircled me. The tightness of the grave found me. I found only distress and anguish. That's all there was. This distress was so deep that it felt like the cold grave already was pressing tightly on me. The diggers were shoveling the dirt over me, and I can't get out. I'm entangled. I'm stuck. I found only distress and anguish. This is intense emotional loss, pain, trauma. We get a little bit more intel up in verses 10 and 11. He says, I am greatly afflicted. In fact, all men are liars. So at least one clue we have of what's going on is he's been betrayed, broken trust, bold-faced lies, and backstabbing. And the psalmist note, he's not ashamed to talk about how he's feeling. There is no mask here. He is opening up his book before us and saying, this is what I was going through. This is how it affected my soul. And I've been turned inside out and upside down. Confusion, disorienting, it's been intense. You know, oftentimes we say, how was your week? Oh, it's been intense. No, it's not been intense. This is intense. And he has been there. And so with great wisdom, with great insight, he shares with us how to walk through this period of trauma. Recently, heard a podcast with an author and a counselor, and he just talked about the consequences of the last two and a half years on the human soul with what we've been dealing with. He says this, you take away normal life, you live in a state of uncertainty for a long time, you be bombarded with constant negative messages, and there's no end date for when things will ever be normal again. All these things compounded to emotional trauma for the human soul on a scale the world has never seen. So regardless of where you sit on your thoughts of the pandemic, COVID, all of that stuff, the facts are in. Divorce, suicide, addictions are sky high. There's not a counselor in the nation who does not have a long, long waiting list. And he said this then, so be kind to your soul and just realize this. You have gone through emotional trauma. Then he added, and when you go through trauma, it does not numb you or desensitize you like other things do when they're repeated. No, emotional trauma actually super sensitized you to every single little prick, point, and needle in your life. And suddenly, the things that you used to have no issue with, that you could deal with, they become mountains and heaps of trouble in your life. And it just seems like they pile on top of you and you can't get out. This is what the psalmist has experienced. And if you have felt that, he has also. Here in verses 3, 10, and 11, he expresses that trauma to God. And all this leads him to cry out in verse 4, Oh, Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. And then we see him thumbing through down to where his 
prayers are written in his journal. And in verse 4 through 11, he is sharing his thoughts and his heart behind his prayers. And looking up again, he says, you know what first helped me? I just began to focus on God's grace in my prayers. I can see it right here, written in my journal. That helped me the most. And that's what he does for us right here in verses 4 through 11. He retraces God's grace as he thinks about what he's going through. Verse 4, then I called in the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. See, the psalmist's entire hope relies on God, who he is, his very nature, and his disposition towards us. He's relying on the name of the Lord. That's the meaning here. The name of the Lord is drawing from Scripture about what the psalmist already knows to be true about God. And he's taking us back to a conversation with Moses and God back in Exodus chapter 33 and 34 where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. You remember the story. Moses goes up. God cuts him out two tablets, writes the instructions for how people are supposed to follow him in love and obedience to his covenant of love back to them. And Moses walks down the mountain, and what's going on? The people are worshiping a golden calf. Moses shatters the tablets in anger, frustration, unbelief. Here you have this great, merciful, kind, forgiving God that he just met with. And here are the people worshiping a golden cow. How ludicrous. How out of perspective and proportion. But that's the people that we are. And so he pushes forward and he opens for us. But this is who, in spite of who we are, this is who our God is. And Moses pushes through to God and says, Lord, please forgive the people. Please go with them to the promised land. And here's how it goes in Exodus 33. He says, this is Moses speaking, Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, Lord, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. And, he, and God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Then we walk into chapter 34, and we find the actual meeting that is taking place. And it says, The Lord descended in the cloud, stood with Moses there on the mountain, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And God says this, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So when the psalmist is calling on the name of the Lord, he's calling on God's very character and disposition to help him. He knows exactly who he's going to. He's going to God himself whose very heart is bound up to hear his cry for rescue because that's who God is. And how God responds to us is directly rewired to who he is. You can't separate them. So he will always listen. He will always respond with grace. He is merciful. He is forgiving. He is kind to us. That's his disposition to his people who love him, who put their trust in him. It's wired into God to respond to our cries for help. So think of it this way. God says, I am gracious, so I'm going to extend grace to you, showing you compassion. I am merciful, so I am going to show you mercy, forgiving you of every single sin. I am good, so I will lash, lavish all my goodness and kindness on you. I am faithful, so I will never leave you. I am steadfast in love. I will never stop loving you. I never change. I'm always, always, always 
ready to do you good. My heart is for you. No wonder David writes in Psalm 9, verse 10, those who know your name trust in the Lord. How could you not trust and love a God like that who has nothing but your very best at heart for everything that goes on in your life? There's been a recent song on the radio past year or so, and it's called My God is Still the Same. Here's a couple words, a couple refrains. When did he break his promise? When did his kindness fail? Never has, never will. My God is still the same. When did he lose his power? When did his mercy ever change? Never has, never will. My God is still the same. Do you know God like that? Solid, a rock, trustworthy, uncrumbling, faithful, true. Someone you can run to in and out of every single season in your life. The psalmist is simply retracing who God is. And he says in verse 6, when I was brought low, he saved me. Have you called on God to rescue you? Who else are you going to call? Who else can you run to? Who can handle the weight of your heaviness, your sorrow, your trauma? There is no one but the Lord. And we who have the biggest lament of all on our hands, all our sin and rebellion, he has come to make an end of it all. He saved me. Do you know his love, his mercy, his forgiveness and grace? The psalmist wants you to taste and see, oh, the Lord is good. The next note he shares from his prayer journal are about a longing for peace and rest after all he's been through. See, the psalmist is still retracing God's grace and he's looking to find rest in God. Verse 7 and 8, Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. So at some time in the distant past, the psalm, psalmist was experienced some form of rest, some type of normalcy in his life, whatever that looked like for him, because trauma had not yet turned everything inside out and upside down. But now his soul was not at rest. In fact, every light on his dashboard was going off. And perhaps that's your space right now. Perhaps that's a season that you're in or you're coming out of one. And the psalmist is showing us that the rest of your soul is too fragile to rely on circumstances, finances, job security, health, even friends, family even a spouse. None of those things can bear the weight of what rest requires because all those things are changing. And if we rely on people, even a great loved one in our life, they too are under the same strain we are. They too are on shifting ground without God in different areas where their rest is undone. And so we need no one but God my God, he never changes, never has, never will. My God is still the same. And that's where the psalmist wants us to run to. In that same conversation with Moses on Sinai, God says in Exodus 33, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. It's God's presence in your life that will give you rest. When he's with you, there will be rest. And that's just not a one-time promise to Moses. Jesus gave the very same promise. Matthew 11, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It wasn't a one and done offer. It's there for you right now, today. I will give you rest for your troubled soul, for your emotions that are aching, for the trauma that you've been under. Don't call out, call on the name of the Lord for rest. And there's only one qualifier. Come 
to Jesus. Come. Come to Jesus. That's it. And I will give you rest, he says. Rest for the psalmist has seen everything roll back in a great reversal of his lament of verse 3. He writes in verse 8, You've de- delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. In other words, I'm experiencing life with God again. I can breathe because of his goodness to me. My heart's alive. My soul is at rest. God did it all. And he's telling us that as he's looking through the journal with us, peering over his shoulder. He says, now I'm walking with God in the everyday routine of life, and my soul is at rest. Does that mean that the psalmist is never again going to experience trauma or emotional distress or upside-down periods in his life where he feels everything is undone? No, certainly not. But what it does reveal is that he believes and trusts God through the very darkest moments that he encountered. That's what he writes for us in verses 10 and 11. I believed even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said even in my alarm, all mankind are liars. But yet he says, I believed I believed even when I was going through that because why? God held his faith firm even in those dark troubles. The Apostle Paul recognizes this in Psalm 116 and he quotes this verse in 2 Corinthians 4. He writes in this kind of truncated section just for time. He says there, since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, here's the quote, I believed and so I spoke Speaking about faith, we also believe and so we also speak. We do not lose heart, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparisons. So the psalmist is saying, this is real faith, that even in the midst of trauma, even in the midst of lament, my soul can still find rest as it expresses faith in God, because my God is still the same. He doesn't change. Grace, mercy, forgiveness, loving kindness, steadfast love. It's there always. It's who I am. And that's his kind disposition to us every single waking moment of our life. That's who our God is. So when everything and everyone seems against you, the question is, will you lose heart? Or will your soul find rest in God? That's the real question. What are you going to do with the trouble and trauma that piles in on you that you have no control on? Where is your soul going to find rest? The psalmist says, it's only one, only one place. It's God. And he's got it. He's got you in his hands. You can find rest and peace in him. And as the psalmist now closes his journal and he's sitting across the table from us, He's overcome with grateful joy. And he just is smiling and he says in verse 12, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? What can I do? I've seen all this grace in my life. How can I respond? What do I do? A couple weeks ago, I had another truck mishap. It seems to be a common occurrence lately. And uh, we were out and uh, all the Dad, all the lights on the dashboard went off. I never knew I had such a Christmas tree on my dashboard. And uh, so the thing gets towed in. The key is locked in the ignition on these crazy electronic cars. The, uh, the, uh, it's locked in park. I can't even get it into neutral. You can't do anything. It's just stuck. You're helpless. So we get it on a tow truck and we send it in to Ben. Well, a couple days later, it does eventually get fixed alternator was bad, water pump went out, all kinds of stuff. Anyways, I pull out my wallet, and I'm going to pay for it. Pull out the good old plastic. It's expensive. He goes, you don't need that. What? Someone paid it. Oh, come on. I was stunned. I think maybe my family and a couple people knew about this, so I don't know what in the world happened. And I just sat there, kept holding out my card. Take it. 
And they're like, you don't understand. Show me the invoice. Here's the amount. Balance due, zero. What do you do? How do you respond to that? I can't pay back grace. That's exactly what that was. That was grace I didn't deserve. Grace I wasn't owed. It just happened. Someone stepped in and take on my debt. That's how the psalmist feels as he tries to figure out, how can I respond to you, Lord? And he says there in verses 12 through 19, what we're seeing is a new return. And I say that because it says here in the word, render. How can I render to the Lord? Render is not payback because you can't pay back grace. And the psalmist knows that. So he selects the word render, and that means return. It means, what do I come back with? What is my, uh, oh, what is my heart filled with as I come back to you, Lord, and return out of this time of darkness back into joy and life with God's people? That's what's going on in verses 13 through 19. So we know that he's not talking about paying back. How do you pay for, pay for mercy? How do you pay for grace? How do you pay for forgiveness? How do you pay for life back from the grave? You can't. How many times do we think we can? Oh, I'm, I'm going to give you this, God. I'm going to do this for you, God. I'm going to do that for you, God. It's all meaningless unless our heart is wrapped in it with true gratitude and praise for God. And the psalmist here makes that clear. He gives us six clear ways to return to, the God, to return to God. And they're all right before us. First, he returns with a new testimony. Verse 13. He says, I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. So we can't pay, but we can offer up to God the blessings that he has already given to us by his grace. That's what he's saying there by the cup of salvation. The cup is just a metaphor in Scripture for what we have received, what we're drinking from, what has been given to us. And in the Psalms, we have many pictures of a cup of judgment that is laid out for the unrepentant and rebellious sinner that will someday have to drink down because they have not given their life in trust to Jesus Christ. But that's never the case for the believer. For the believer, all we drink down is the cup of blessing. All we drink down is mercy, grace, forgiveness. Our cup is to the brim with the blessings that are ours through Jesus Christ. David expresses it this way in Psalm 23. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Talking about the blessings of the Holy Spirit in his life. Psalm 16, the Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The times of the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Talking about his hope and future in God. So the cup we drink is full to the brim of sweet, sweet blessing. Grace, kindness, mercy, love. And that's what the psalmist is offering up. He's responding with the stories of God's grace in his life and what he has done. This is not a time for personal journal entries and personal reflection only. No, this is a time to spell these things out and share with the people of God what God has been doing. This is a public testimony of what God's been doing in his life. We know that by scanning down to verses 14 and 18. This is all taking place in the presence of all his people, God's people, brothers and sisters in Christ, those who love Jesus like them. Further, we see in 19, that context is in the courts of the house of the Lord, where believers gather. For us today, that's the church, the local church. So I lift up, I proclaim, I make much of the cup of, in, of salvation. Why? To encourage you. So that you might encourage 
other brothers and sisters who might be in that period of lament, that you can let their eyes gaze on the goodness of God and elevate the rest of their souls towards God, to encourage them to call on the name of the Lord and not trust in circumstances that are crumbling around them. That's what the psalmist is doing. I lift up the powerful work in my life to encourage others to trust him more. So what does that mean for us as a church? We should be and have a constant chatter in the church. Not gossip, not things about what's going on with the weather and sports and all of those things. Those are all good. But a constant chatter about God's grace being retraced through our life, adding to our ever-present story of what God is doing in our life right now, today, through our times of hardship, trials, troubles. You have a blessing to give to your other brothers and sisters in Christ, and that is your story that God has traced in your life. What's your story? What's he doing in your life? It's not meant to just be covered up and just go, oh, I'm I'm okay. I'm doing all right. No. It is a time for you to say, let me tell you, this is what happened and this is what God did. This is how I was feeling. This is who God is. Never changes, never will. My God is still the same. And you encourage each other and grow in sharing what Jesus has done in our lives. We all need to grow in that and do a better job at that. So keep up the chatter, church. Then in verse 14 and 18, he repeats a strange thing to our ears. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Well, what's that all about? It's a return with new faithfulness. The word vow, we don't use it much. We just hear it as uh, at weddings, really. It's just a promise, right? That's a vow. Otherwise, we don't hear it much anymore. But you definitely make vows under your breath quite often, and especially with the Lord. They go something like this. Lord, if you do this, I will do this. If you show up here in my life, I will do this. Right? Been there? God, if only this happened, I'll do this. If you show up here, man, I'm going to serve you more. Next year, it's going to be a whole different ballgame. Man, if, if you just elevate my salary to this, I'll take the next step of faith and give you more. Right? How many broken promises have you left undone before God? The psalmist goes back with a newfound faithfulness to God and says, none of that anymore. I'm going forward with what God has done and what I want to do for him out of gratitude. You know, in the Bible, God never requires us to make a vow. He never says, you do this. What he does ask us for is obedience, not just an idea of our promise. But obedience, yes. And he says there in Ecclesiastes 5, when you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It's better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin and do not say before the messenger, oh, it was all a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the works of your hand? So what promises have you made to God that might lie forgotten? You may have said, I'm going to go on a mission trip. You may have said, I'm going to serve you, Lord, full time. In fact, I'm going to go to seminary. In fact, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go become a counselor. I'm going to complete this. I would encourage you to go back, retrace those in your life, and follow up on it. It's important to God, so it's important for you. And then he takes us in verse 15 and 16 as he returns in a new assurance. 
He says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have loosed my bonds. And at first, this baffled me. It's like, what a strange place to insert this. Here he's talking about renewed worship in God, and it seems like he's winding back and going backwards, talking about God's grace in his life to get him out of trauma and lament. He's talking about death again, and he's talking about how that's precious in the sight of the Lord. What's that all about? The psalmist is thinking again about the context of sharing this with the congregation of believers. Again, verse 14, 18, 19. In the courts of the Lord, in the presence of all God's people. What he is doing is he is adding to his testimony about the steadfast love of God and how he has protected him through those dark times. So imagine you're sitting with the psalmist and he says this. You know, when I was at death's door, even there I felt the very presence and love of God for me. He loved me through my time of COVID, through cancer, through leukemia, through that car accident. I know his love is real. So you can count on him too. I know it might seem dark to you right now, but your life is precious to your Savior. He always listens. He always will be there. He never changes. My God is still the same. And that's what he's saying here. Oh, how we need that encouragement from one another during those dark seasons in our life when we're looking at a report from the dock through tears in our eyes, when our spouse has passed away, when our child has passed away way before time. Those things are soul-wrenching. That's trauma. And there's nowhere to turn but to God. And how we need to reassure one another with that fresh assurance that God is alive and real and present and able to help. And then in verse 17, uh, he returns with new gratitude. Well, that's real simple to see here. He says, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. Again, it's the same idea as the others. It's with other brothers and uh, sisters uh, just to share with a heart full of gratitude about what God has done because of his character and his nature in your life. If you're like me, I love being around grateful people. Some of you are right here. And your stories and the way that you approach life changes my outlook on God. It changes on my own gratefulness and praise and worship towards God. Say, I'm so blessed by God, I hear you say. He's been so good to me. Oh, I thank him for this. I thank him for that. And it's contagious in a church. Thankful saints are giving, forgiving, and loving saints. But grumblers rarely are gracious, loving, or forgiving. And to grow in gratitude, you only need to do what the psalmist shares with us here. So if you need to grow in gratitude and thankfulness like I do, a good way to do it is just recount the blessings of God's grace in your life. Just write them down. Make a note. Go back on it. I guarantee you, your heart will grow in gratitude and thankfulness. And then he returns in verse 19 as we wind this down, he returns in new worship. It says, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Well, the temple is a place of worship for the psalmist. That's the presence of God with God's people. So he starts right there. He says, I want to stand with the other believers of God in the courts where I can praise God with my other brothers and sisters where together we can lift up and praise him together. You know, perhaps the psalmist is thinking about maybe some apathy in his life when things were going well, when he was just like, hmm, plowing through life and going, this is great. Oh, and he was seeing God's grace. He was seeing God's goodness. But he wasn't seeing the depth of God's care and grace and 
his power to work in his life and turn and open his heart up to a deeper understanding of who God was. But that was then, and this is now. And the psalmist bursts with exuberant praise, praise the Lord, or hallelujah, or alleluia, Yahweh. You may say it in all those different forms. And you'll see in this section in book five, that is loaded phrase through many of these psalms. And the last five psalms, Psalm 145 to 150, those are all start and end with praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord exuberant gratitude and thankfulness. Where's your thermostat of gratitude? What's that thermometer reading right now? Are you dialed in to God's grace in your life? I'd encourage you to recount and retrace his grace and grow and join in that along with me. And finally, the most important thing, the most important thing for us to see is this. The psalmist returns in a new love. Go back with me up to verse 1, right where his first summary statement is. I love the Lord. See, the end of lament should always expand our heart for a deeper love of God. That's the prize, to know God and to enjoy Him forever, to delight in His grace, His mercy, His presence, His character. Because when you get wrapped up in God, love expands. You experience His presence in a rich new way. And you want to do all that the psalmist has shown us in returning in worship, thankfulness, gratefulness, gratitude. All of those things grow when your love for God grows. And that is the prize for the believer, to know Jesus more, to know God richer and deeper in a new way. The psalmist is taking us on that journey. He's opened up his prayer book. He's shared with us his journal entries. He's shown us the scriptures that he's, that he's gone through in his own life as he's crawled out of that darkness. And he sets a true and clear path for us to do the same. And as he closes up his journal, he smiles, he looks in your eyes, and he says with warmth, I love the Lord. Do you? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your great mercy, so rich and free. Thank you that through the pen of the psalmist, through this song that he writes, we capture his emotion, we capture his distress, and we also see his great joy as he sees your grace traced in his life. Oh, Lord, how we can grow in gratitude for all you've done for us how we need our focus shifted from this darkness of the world and onto the light of the glory that's given to us in the face of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray for myself. Lord, I ask that we would see you for who you truly are, good, merciful, gracious, forgiving, patient, steadfast, loving. Oh, you're good all the time and you're working in us all the time, and you're listening to us all the time. We are never alone. My God is still the same. He will never change. So, Lord, I pray that you would take this and dig this deep into our hearts right now, that we would know you for who you are. Lord, I ask for the the soul that's faint, that is weary, that is crumbled, that is in somewhat the shadows Lord, draw them into your great love. Show them your care for them. Open their eyes, Holy Spirit. Let them see your goodness. We thank you for doing that, Jesus. You are the very image of God in the flesh. All we need to do to see grace is to look to you. In your good name we pray, amen.